Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's Head and Neck weekly webinars. Um, so, a lot of you have been joining us uh, every week, twice uh, a week. I mean, uh, now this is our 17th session uh, this week, and uh, we are looking forward to an active participation from everyone in the uh, audience. And we also urge uh, everyone to you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, the AHNOK webinars, which is, uh, uh, which will give you all the videos uh, that have been, uh, you know, all the sessions that have been covered so far are uploaded on the video. So please uh, subscribe to that channel. And uh, this is the second module of our Head and Neck webinar series. We've had the first module on neck, which concluded uh, about two or three weeks back. And the oral module has, uh, has had some great speakers join us from, you know, all over the world and all over the country. And we've had some really stimulating sessions so far. And we're looking forward to a great, uh, I mean, you know, a superb session today as well uh, by Dr. Deepa Nair. So the topics that have been lined up um, for the coming weeks are as follows. And please join us. Uh, there may be a few changes in the dates, but we'll keep you updated. And uh, this has only been possible because of the continued support of our academia, that is the Academia of Head and Neck Oncology of Karnataka, which is affiliated to the Asian Oncology Society. And uh, this allows a head and neck surgeon or a trainee head and neck surgeon in Karnataka to remain connected with all the head and neck surgeons in our state and also gives a lot of benefits. Student benefits um, are also uh, you know, given uh, through the academia. So please uh, join. You can write to info at ahnok.org for more information. Uh, so we've been conducting these webinars with the support of my senior colleagues, Dr. Vishal Rao, Dr. Ravi Nair, Dr. Akshay Kurpaje, and also with the help of my colleagues, Dr. Anand Shubash, uh, Dr. Bhargav, and Dr. Ritri Bagadia. So thank you, everybody, for the support. To introduce today's uh, speakers and moderator, uh, Dr. Girish Shetkar, who is the moderator for today, joins us from Site Care in Bangalore. He's a consultant head neck surgeon, uh, head neck uh, surgical oncologist with a special interest in advanced and very advanced uh, uh, head neck uh, cancers. He also uh, specializes in uh, head neck reconstruction as well. He's been trained at uh, Mazumdar Shaw Cancer Center and has a vast experience uh, of over of about 10 years in the head neck uh, speciality. He's also uh, worked at uh, Ahmedabad and also worked previously at Mazumdar Shaw Cancer Center. He has, to his credit, uh, many uh, international and national publications and has also been a guest speaker, panelist, and expert at many national and international conferences. And he is also the founder, honorary treasurer of the Karnataka State Chapter of AOMSI, which is the Association of Microlocation Surgeons of India. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Uh, I hand over the session to you now to introduce our speaker for the day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Shalini, for the introduction. Uh, thank your entire team for taking this initiative and, you know, uh, having done a wonderful uh, uh, webinar series in the last few weeks and also uh, looking forward in the coming weeks. So uh, coming to today's uh, webinar, it gives me immense uh, pleasure and honor to in, uh, introduce uh, uh, a good friend, uh, Dr. Deepa Nair, uh, who uh, is, is, is a otolaryngologist, uh, did our MS, uh, DNB, and also uh, diploma in otolaryngology in 2005, 2006. And after which uh, she has been working as a professor and uh, associate uh, surgeon at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai and also holds a position at the ACTREC uh, wing of uh, Tata. Uh, well, uh, she's got many uh, sort of honors uh, to her uh, in, a, in a career where uh, she has been awarded the uh, gold medal from the president of India, uh, Dr. Shankar Dayal Sharma, uh, during her uh, uh, post-graduation post days. And also she's won a Kameshwaran gold medal uh, in her DNB in uh, 2006. And uh, she's got to her credit, uh, many best paper awards in many national international conferences and uh, also has been the principal investigator in multiple uh, uh, studies that uh, she, she's been a part of. And uh, she's got over 100 uh, publications in uh, reputed uh, or peer reviewed uh, uh, scientific journals. 
and uh, has been, uh, uh, I would say, one of the young uh, uh, head and neck uh, 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 oncosurgeon or physician who has contributed and has continued to contribute a lot to our field. So it's, it's going to be a pleasure uh, listening to such an uh, exhaustive topic that she is going to talk to all of us on the, the uh, landmark articles that have been there in our field over the last many decades. So without much ado, I would invite uh, Dr. Deepa Nair to, uh, to, to uh, ha have a presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those kind uh, words, Girish. I think a lot of it is uh, a bit exaggerated, but thank you nevertheless. I really have been enjoying these webinars which have happened over the last month. And I find this concept very interesting where you have taken it out for residents. Uh, I have attended a few and the lectures have really been top notch. So I'm very proud and honored to be uh, a part here today. Uh, today is a, a topic, my topic of discussion, and I'm going to share my screen, is landmark articles in uh, uh, influencing cl uh, clinical practice in oral cancer. Now this is actually quite a, a uh, long, to uh, large topic, a uh, lot of uh, things to be covered in a very short time. So I'm really just going to briefly uh, talk about a few articles which I find are practice changing over the uh, time period. And a lot of these may have been covered previously in the next session. Some will be covered in the oral cavity and other future sessions uh, which are coming too. So this is just an overview of the whole thing, how practice has changed with research predominantly affecting and improving outcomes for patients. Now let's see uh, what exactly do you mean by landmark? A landmark is basically an uh, event which has changed history and landmarks change over periods of time. Uh, but even in the field of medicine for our patients, our oral cancer patients, hospitals are actually landmarks. And uh, when we come to the field of cancer for doctors, what do we mean by landmark? Well, when you define a landmark article, a landmark article is actually defined as an article, abstract, or a work which has been published in a journal, which is regarded by other workers in the field as a study which has some uh, impact on the area. It has to be a seminal work which will produ uh, provide new or unique insights or new results into studies which have been done in, and these actually these seminal studies provide the foundation for future references. Generally these landmark articles are highly cited and all of us know how important it is to have good citation indexes nowadays. Good landmark articles which are well researched actually form the basis of EBM and they bring about a paradigm change in the understanding treatment and management of diseases. Now we all know uh, what are the levels of EBM and just for the residents, just to recapitulate, the highest level of evidence is when you have a systematic review with homogeneity of randomized controlled trials. Uh, that's level 1A, which is the highest evidence and coming back to case series, which are generally poor quality cohort and case control series, which is level 4. Unfortunately, in oral cancer, though it the magnitude in terms of the numbers are so high, most of the evidence would be somewhere between level two and level three. Very rare level one evidence is present when you look at oral cancer uh, trials per se. So today I'm looking at the topic and I've sort of broadly defined it as uh, disease biology and epidemiology, diagnostic techniques, management of the neck for oral cancer, surgical aspects with respect to the resection, preservation, reconstruction of the mandibular maxilla, involvement of the infratemporal fossa, adjuvant therapy, and management of recurrent and metastatic disease. Now coming to disease biology and epidemiology. This is basically not for oral cancer alone, but this is a very good review article uh, published looking at the molecular changes which have occurred in head and neck cancers over the decades. This was published last year in 2019. And if you see treatment of oral cancer, most head and neck cancers were really surgical based till the introduction of radiotherapy. You know that the first laryngectomies happened in the eight, uh, 19th century, but radiotherapy actually was introduced in the uh, early 1920s. And that actually impacted disease control and changed the management of head and neck cancers overall. 
then as you progress around the decades you see most of the newer inventions and the newer uh, things which have been discovered and advances especially in the field of chemotherapy and radiotherapy and targeted therapy have all centered around this last decade and it's exciting times if you are a molecular biologist a, a, a surgeon scientist or someone especially in the medical oncology field most of the ASCO meetings now only talk about PDL1 inhibitors and immunotherapies. And as surgeons, I think we'll also try, try to see how we can incorporate these into our surgical practice. I think if you talk about biology and oral cancer, we can't go without talking about this paper by Slaughter. Field cancerization in oral stratified squamous epithelium, published in 1953 in Cancer. All of us have quoted this on and again, talking about field cancerization. Most of us may not have read the paper completely. I have not read it myself, but we have read excerpts of it. 783 patients reviewed. This was the first attempt to actually look at the multicentricity of oral squam cell carcinoma. They looked at 783 patients with lip, oral cavity, and pharynx, and they found that Slaughter said that every time the tumor was one centimeter or less in diameter, there were separate foci of in-situ cancer or isolated islands of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Independent foci were found in epithelium surrounding larger tumors. And so he called this process field cancerization in which the whole epithelium has been preconditioned by as an uh, as yet unknown carcinogenic agent. Remember, this was in 1953. And we all know that tobacco carcinogenesis uh, was discovered and uh, understood much better later. So basically, the agent, which is tobacco, and to some extent alcohol, causes multiple changes, which is what is called field cancerization. And this is the reason for high local recurrence rate in oral cancer. Uh, the genetic changes, which was basically uh, why field cancerization occurs, was very well noted by Joe Calfano, in 1996 and he actually described how this field cancerization is basically at the molecular level where there are changes in the uh, at the, the genetic level where you have 90 loss from normal mucosa going on to uh, been, uh, either a dysplasia and then further progressions and genetic losses accumulating causing carcinoma in situ and finally invasion and this basically showed that 30% of patients who had benign histological squamous hypoplastic lesions had genetic alterations and would eventually progress to malignancy in some cases. And this was a genetic basis for slaughter's field cancerization. So basically the molecular basis correlated with what slaughter had described decades before as a clinical basis. Now coming, I think one, when you look at the epidemiology, one of those areas uh, article in 2009 was really seminal because it's got so many citations. It was one of the best studies which actually talked about global epidemiology of oral and oropharyngeal cancer, which is really not a concern so much for the Western population. Because as you see, the areas in red, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Brazil to some extent, are the places where actually these cancers predominate. It is the most common cancer in this area and contribute up to 25% of the cases. And there's a 24 variation in geographical variation in these cancers. He found that most of these cases had uh, tobacco and alcohol as the predisposing factors. And 38 times uh, uh, the, patients, uh, the patients who are heavy drinkers and smokers will have 38 times the risk of developing oral and oropharyngeal cancer. Interestingly, he noted that buccal mucosa complex is more restricted to Southeast Asia where the use of betel nut is much more common and chew, uh, chewing tobacco is much more uh, common than smoked tobacco, which is what is seen in the rest of the world. Now, this is an interesting paper and I've in included this because they actually try to quantify the risk of uh, separate alcohol in, uh, use and tobacco use in people and looked at it in an epidemiological perspective. They had a large database of more than 10,000 patients uh, and 15,000 control subjects. They saw that patients who were never drinkers but smoked tobacco had an odds ratio of 2.13% uh, of developing cancer. 
and this was dose dependent depending on the fact years of smoking similarly people who never used tobacco but were drinkers with more, three or more pegs per day had an odds ratio of two times developing cancer so basically they uh, were able to demonstrate that tobacco and alcohol are independent uh, association of each other though they have synergistic activity they are also independent risk factors for developing oral cancer now coming to diagnostic techniques i think uh, especially uh, the most problematic areas in diagnosis is the detection of n0 nodes and everyone knows this paper by debond this was a meta analysis comparing various imaging techniques for uh, di diagnosing lymph node metastasis in head and neck cancers they looked at ct scan usg mri usg guided fnac and uh, uh, again usg guided uh, F uh, mri what they found was that the sensitivity was highest for usg uh, but the specificity was highest for usg guided fnac with a uh, with almost 98% specificity and they uh, they, are, they concluded that usg guided fnac was the most accurate imaging modality to de detect cervical node metastasis when patients have occult nodal metastasis however this has come into uh, a lot of discussions later on because usgs are very operator specific and uh, these results which debont has found in his meta analysis may not really hold true a later meta analysis of similar uh, imaging modalities was done in two, uh, by leo in 2012 what he found was that uh, sensitivity of ct scan was slightly lower than usg which uh, 52% was 60% but specificity was the best for ct scan of 93% compared to usg which was only 78% and if you compare ct scan mri and pet they are almost similar but the specificity is uh, better for ct scan this really established that ct scan of the head and neck may be the best imaging modality for diagnosis of patients when early uh, with clinically n0 disease when you want to look at neck metastasis continuing with the concept of neck management uh, let's talk about neck dissection one of our favorite surgeries at head and neck surgeons neck dissection actually has a very interesting history the evolution of neck dissection from the radicality and now we are trying to reduce our neck dissections and this is really reading the history itself is very interesting neck dissection was first described by hayes martin in 1951 again can, uh, in a very high impact journal like cancer they gave 59 pages of a detailed description of this procedure which they called a radical neck dissection they included 1450 cases operated over three decades uh, three decades in mskcc in new york they said that they do not do prophylactic neck dissection and they very strongly use the words that if you are trying to reserve the spinal accessory this procedure should be condemned unequivocally so their concept was remove all the fibro fatty tissue remove the spinal accessory remove preserve only the carotid don't preserve anything else the carotid and the vagus were the only possible two things which they preserve they would remove the spinal accessory the sternomastoid the igv to radically remove all disease and this is the time where the breast surgeons also were quite uh, aggressive doing radical mastectomies for all patients because they felt that unless you remove the cancer completely it's going to come back however as time progressed in the next decade boca and suarez in two different parts of the world suarez in chile and boca in italy actually described something what they call a conservative neck dissection where they felt that radicality was really not necessary anymore what suarez described that the crucial point was to remove the whole aponeurotic system in one piece so basically a concept of all block resection removing all the fibro fatty tissue enclosing the uh, lymph nodes in the neck and this was similar to what boca described at the same time Uh, but they've all we've talked about preserving the igv the carotid artery the spinal accessory nerve and this was the basis of a modified radical neck dissection as classically described again these are pictures from their articles the suarez menu and the boca's triangle trainees will very well uh, attribute uh, relate to this i think more 
I always keep telling my uh, juniors, especially when the first posters who are paid, okay, level 2B, Boca's triangle. So these are things which we've learned from our seniors who have learned it from their seniors. And this has been coming down due to this uh, great work by these two pioneers, Boca and Suarez. I'm really proud to say that the first randomized controlled trial for neck dissection actually took it was a part from uh, came from Tata Memorial Hospital, and this was the first randomized control trial for oral cancer, uh, at least with respect to management of the neck. 100 patients were enrolled over two, three years, and these patients were uh, basically tongue cancers divided into hemiglossectomy versus hemiglossectomy with radical neck dissection. They found significant difference in DFS in both arms. The disease-free survival was a primary outcome for these patients and they found that if you do not do the neck, you have inferior survival in both T1 and T2 patients, more significantly in T2 patients. Another interesting concept which was brought about that they found that if you have a tumor depth more than four millimeters, they are more likely to be nodal metastasis. So one of the interpretations of the study was if you have tumors which are deeper than four millimeters you have to offer neck dissection to these patients. Byers article again uh, this is a highly cited article uh, published in 1997 in Head and Neck. It talked about skip metastasis in oral tongue cancers. Now they looked at uh, 20 years of patients operated in an MD Anderson. There were 277 patients uh, around 15% of these patients had level 4 metastasis, either as only manifestation of disease or a level 3 node in which there was no disease in level 1 and 2. This didn't make sense because what we know that uh, generally the uh, metastasis in the neck is level wise and it is, has a predetermined drainage pathway, especially in a per primum patient. So uh, Byers actually suggested that one to three or a selective neck dissection, SOHT, is not adequate and you must do one to four as a minimum surgery of tongue and this is actually followed in a lot of centers even today. But it had many flaws. These patients, uh, this study included node positive patients, also patients who were not just clinically node negative but clinically node positive patients. They had a, a lack of sampling of other levels when patients had nodal recurrence, and they did this retrospectively. So we don't know whether the nodes, nodal stations were addressed properly. So there's an inherent bias in the study. When you look at Jatin Shah's paper, again, this was a seminal paper in, uh, published in Cancer in two, uh, 1990. They divided 500 patients into two groups, almost 300 patients in who were clinically N0 and 200 patients who were clinically node positive. Now, these clinically node negative patients either went in, I, uh, underwent elective radical neck dissection. Remember, at that time, radical neck dissection was the standard of care. Or they, uh, some of them were on beta and watch, around 100 patients. And these patients, if they developed nodes, underwent surgery subsequently. Then a clinically node positive patients underwent immediate neck dissection. Now, this uh, was uh, data which was almost two and a half decades. They found that 34% uh, of patients who uh, underwent elective neck dissection had nodal disease. 69% of the patients who had uh, clinically obvious uh, uh, no, subsequent disease. So the, uh, in 69 patients who were kept under observation, they had to ultimately do a neck dissection. And 90% of the patients who had, were clinically node positive had neck node involvement. But contrary to Bayer's paper, they found only an incidence of 3% uh, nodal metastasis at level 4. This is in the patients who are clinically N0 who had undergone a neck dissection. So uh, Bayer's paper and uh, Jatin Shah's paper after that sort of contradicting uh, Bayer's hypothesis. What's important to notice that in Jatin Shah's paper, there were no nodal metastasis in level 5 in tongue, RMT, and cheek cancers. But uh, some level 5 nodal metastasis were seen in flow of mouth disease or gingival buccal sulcus diseases. This paper actually formed the basis for reducing the extent of neck dissection. And from modified radical neck dissections they, or radical neck dissections, they went on to reducing the neck dissections to selective neck dissections. 
we cannot talk about NEC without talking about Weiss's paper. This is basically a decision analysis which was used to plan the management strategy for N0 NEC. And basically the paper says that if the incidence of nodule metastasis by site and stage of the tumor is more than 20%, you should treat the neck. And that uh, treatment should be a single modality. And this base, uh, paper formed the basis for elective uh, neck dissection for high risk sites and stages. The seminal article, one of the well-quoted, highly cited randomized controlled trials, again from Tata Memorial Hospital, Dr. Anil De Cruz was the leading uh, investigator in this, and I'm happy to be a part of the study. Uh, over 10 years, we've randomized 596 patients. This analysis was of the first 500 patients. What and the overall survival was primary endpoint. We found that doing a neck dissection gives an absolute survival benefit of 12.5%. So that it not just reduces the incidence of recurrences, it actually saves lives. And another important thing was that when the depth of invasion increases from three millimeters to four millimeters, the nodal yield increases to 16.9%. This is again the subgroup analysis, and I'm sure this was taken in the last module, so I'm not really going to delve on it again. Now, uh, the controversy of neck dissection did not stop with that. This is the STEN trial. This is a multicentric trial done in the UK, which was stopped early. They uh, had planned a sample size of 300 odd patients, but they stopped at 250 patients because of the N0 study from Tata Memorial, which unequivocally showed that neck dissection is important. So they pulled their data of the randomized patients on the study, the SEN study, and 346 observational cohort they found that occult net nodal disease was present in 20% of T1 and 35% of T2 cases. Again, if you uh, see the pooled meta-analysis where they've included papers in, uh, from Fucky, Dick Cruz, Kleigerman, and all, if you do a neck dissection, you're saving lives as well as reducing local recurrence. Uh, now we know that neck dissection is standard of care but people still want to do something lesser and central node biopsy is the next new thing which is there. So the SEND trial results were interesting. This was again a study from the uh, UK. Uh, this, uh, there were 415 patients, uh, central node biopsy done. Uh, they found that there were 3.2 nodes removed per person and they found central node biopsies in 99.5%. So it's a good standardized technique They were able to find central nodes in these patients of which 23% were positive, but this had a high false negative rate, up to 15% false negative rate, which is quite significant. What they found was that if you do a central node biopsy, the disease specific survival is quite good, 94%, and sensitivity of central node biopsy is 86%, but more importantly, the negative predictive value is 95% and it's a reliable and safe oncological technique. After this, there have been a couple of randomized control trials which were discussed in last ASCO and this ASCO. We are still awaiting the full text and I'm sure some of them in the future are going to be quoted in the landmark articles. That brings us to the next aspect, which is surgical aspect of oral cancers. And this is the one of the only trials looking at surgery versus radiotherapy for the management of intraoral tumors. This was a multicentric study in the UK in 1998. The target sample size was 350 patients, but they had to stop the study at only 35 patients. And this is because there was clear inequality between the arms. Of the 18 patients who received RT, 16 people died after 23 months whereas only eight patients out of the 17 who had undergone surgery. Looking at these results, they didn't even bother to go ahead and they just stopped the uh, trial prematurely. Initially, the uh, reluctance to do surgery was they found that morbidity of oral cavity surgery may be very high, and hence patients and physicians prefer to give radiotherapy to this patient. But this clear-cut difference showed that Surgery is actually saving lives, and the primary treatment for oral cavity cancer should be surgery. Uh, 
when we talk about mandible to the mandible one of the worries when you treat oral cancer is how is this mandible going to be involved by its squamous cell carcinomas especially in the gingival buccal sulcus or buccal tumors which are close to the mandible so uh, mcgregor and mcdonald actually looked at routes of entries uh, into the mandible by the cancer now these were edentulous non irradiated mandibles and they found that in uh, edentulous non radiated mandibles most of the involvement was through the alveolar crest but when the patients had uh, irradiated mandibles the roots were more varied there were loss of distinction between the soft tissue and uh, mandible and there was loss of periosteal protection so this actually this study tells us that you should not you can conserve the mandible if the patient has a dentate mandible because the only uh, most of the things are done from the point uh, occlusal surface but if the patient has uh, been radiated you should avoid conservation contrary to this study was james brown study in 2002 where again he did a series of pathological examination of 100 mandibular resections he decalcified the mandible before slicing them into 5 mm blocks and he again looked at the routes of entry what he found was the route of entry was direct in 28% of the patients direct to junction of the attached and reflected nucleus in the dentate patient occlusal surface in 23 patients the pattern of invasion was basically dependent on the depth of invasion both in the hard and soft tissues in the dentate mandible the point of entry was a point of abutment as the reflection of the tumor to the bone so it is not through the occlusal surface as per brown study but the point of abutment in the edentulous mandible however sorry uh, i think the photo is gone 50% had it spread through the occlusal surface so what the study actually formed was the basis of marginal mandibular resections so in dentate mandibles because the point of abutment is near the bone if the paramandibular disease is less you can actually consider resecting part of the mandible whereas in an edentulous mandible because of bone resorption and possible spread through the occlusal surface you should not do a marginal mandibular resection now more recently we've been talking about t4b oral cavity cancer t4b if you remember is being classified as any tumor with macetrix based involvement now previously all t4b's were classified as unresectable disease uh, but now over the last two agcc stagings they have classified it as very advanced disease rather than calling all t4b's as unresectable disease and it is one of these papers which has contributed to this understanding now leo's paper was a small paper of 45 patients but these were all patients who were classified as t4 due to b due to involvement of the macetrix space they classified them depending on the sigmoid notch as supra notch and infra notch disease what they found that patients who had infra notch disease that is macetrix space involvement but live below the level of sigmoid notch had significant difference in in uh, local regional control at 5 years and this difference between infra uh, supra notch versus infra notch was significant statistically significant one of the most important adverse factors is the involvement of uh, is the perineural invasion and they, this uh, uh, actually said that if you do surgery for infra notch t4b disease you have good disease survival and uh, favorable outcome so surgery should be still offered for patients who have macetrix space involvement but where the disease is below the t4 uh, in uh, before the notch sorry uh again a taiwanese paper which is more recent this looks at uh, 492 patients a larger cohort and again they looked at patients who were t4 uh, classified as t4a and t4b what they found that if you operated uh, t4a and some t4b the surgical outcome of these patients is similar the patients who underwent salvage surgery uh, uh the patients who were classified as uh, t4b some of them underwent surgery and some didn't undergo surgery but the patients who underwent non surgical treatment also had salvage surgery again these patients who had salvage surgery did much better than patients who had only non surgical treatment 
so you the point of this matter is that if you can operate patients you must offer surgery to all patients of the uh, t4p infra notch disease because disease outcomes uh, local regional control and overall survival will be better in these patients and this is we found similar studies uh, uh, results in our study in our hospital again we classified patients as t4a and t4b disease what we found that if you have good margins local recurrence rate is similar for both uh, cases again this is mostly infra notch disease and the main things which affect dfs and os in this subgroup of patients is presence of nodal metastasis or perineural invasion so model uh, the mess short messages all t4b buccal cancers are not unresectable this is sort of a brief algorithm which was published in that study and uh, you can have good survival in these patients coming to reconstruction uh, boyd's paper in 1989 was one of the seminal papers for re reconstruction of the mandible it was a first objective attempt to classify uh, mandibular resections according to the extent of surgery and according to the reconstructive need basically he used a uh, alphabetical system using either uh, the upper case alphabets like h c and l to classify bony mandibular defects this uh, whereas a small lower cases were given uh, so these uh, uh, multiple defects were classified depending on whether it was heavy mandibulectomy whether it was a central defect or whether it was a lateral defect and such this formed the eight classes of defects this actually standardized the terminology of resection and reconstruction started being th thought about in a different way now he used iliac crest free flap but th this also works for fibula this was modified by brown in 2016 and now they have the four corner principle which actually uses uh, is used for reconstruction based on the number of osteotomies more important than the max uh, mandibular reconstruction for me as a ablative surgeon is this maxillary classification by james brown and he, again it was a very elegant classification where the defects were classified into vertical and horizontal defects the vertical defects were in roman numerals in the horizontal defects in alphabets lower case so you have a combination of defects and this combination of defects they gave a, a idea about what reconstruction can be used like if you have a uh, type 1 defect then you can actually just put in an obturator but anything more than a type 3 defect a class 3 defect you should do reconstruction with either a uh, local flap soft tissue flaps or hard and they actually gave recommendations depending on the type of defect both in the roman numerals as well as the alphabets and suggested what type of reconstruction should be done their emphasis was on the dci internal oblique uh, flap for the maxillary reconstruction but even the free fibula flap can be used skillfully for class 3 defects and obviously you should give orbital support when you're reconstructing the maxilla once you have resected the tumor it's important to remember that you should have adequate margins on your specimen and why is this important this paper published in 1990 is actually very seminal on uh, because it's shown that if you have positive margins which uh, you really impact overall survival in these patients uh, 129 positive surgical margins out of 400 patients so overall survival dipped by almost uh, 8% uh, local recurrences were twice as much when you have positive margins and this definition which they used in those days for positive margins is pretty much what we are still using almost four decades later i think this was discussed just in the last uh, uh two weeks back where dr shah was talking about agcc staging and uh, basically the icor data looks at depth of invasion and has actually impact uh, change the agcc staging so anything which has more than 10 mm has now been upgraded to t3 and depth of invasion is again important as a, a prognostic marker which will impact treatment and treatment should be escalated if patients have depth of invasion of more than 10 mm another poor uh, prognostic factor 
which was uh, discussed more recently was perineal invasion in squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this is all head neck, not just oral cavity. This was Fagan's group in uh, South Africa, which actually looked at this, and they found that patients who had perineal invasion tend to do much more poorly. There's more local recurrence and more disease specific mortality in these patients. So these were the first to suggest that we should stratify outcomes based on PNI, though really that's not gone into practice. But yes, adjuvant therapy has increased in cases of PNI, and we have a lot of retrospective data agreeing to that as well. Coming to adjuvant therapy uh, in oral cancers, one of the only trials which looked at random uh, post-operative radiotherapy in buccal mucosa cancers, this was from Odisha in India, he randomized six, a small trial of 140 patients. Surgery alone versus surgery followed by adjuvant radiotherapy for stage 3, stage 4 disease. Patients had a three-year follow-up. And they found that if you've done only surgery and not given adjuvant radiotherapy to these patients, these patients do much more poorly. Significant, almost a 30% uh, difference in disease-free survivals. Of course, there was some bias because patients who were more clinically node positive were sent by surgeons for post-operative radiotherapy. But one of the important uh, trials which suggested the role of adjuvant radiotherapy as uh, is indicated in all stage 3, stage 4 buccal mucosa cancers. Now, we all know Bernier and Cooper trials. This is unfortunately for all head neck cancer patients, not just for oral cancer. And the short of it is that if you have uh, node positive, positive margins or nodes with extra capsular extension, you should give them uh, adjuvant chemo radiotherapy, and this actually improves disease free and overall survival in these patients. Rifletti actually looked at the impact of chemo radiotherapy for all locally advanced head neck cancer, and uh, they suggested that not just positive margins, but some things like presence of more than five nodes or, uh, should also be given uh, uh, chemoradiotherapy because there may be a clinically relevant survival benefit. But again, this is a matter of debate. And if you see, this is not just oral cavity, this is all subsites. But it's an interesting concept, which a lot of practitioners, especially in the private practice, would look to that if there are multiple nodes, then they would, even if the patients didn't have external extension, would go ahead and give chemo radiotherapy. Though the standard of care still remains CTRT when you have positive margins or extra capsular extension. Coming to the role of NACT in operable oral cancer. Two trials, one by Lisa Lissetra. Uh, the first trial with patients between eight, uh, over 10 years, 195 patients, these are resectable T2 to T4 cancers, oral can uh, squamous cell carcinomas alone, treated with three cycles NECT, followed by surgery versus surgery alone. They found that even though they had a pathological complete response rate of 27%, there was no difference in overall survival. Yes, they could preserve some mandible in these patients who had received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but the point is that these patients did not have any difference in overall survival, so it cannot be recommended as standard of care for operable oral cancer. And the same thing was seen in a larger study by Zong et al., 256 patients. Done, this was done in China. The primary endpoint was two years overall survival. Again, no statistical difference, even if you give two cycles of PPF versus surgery upfront. What is interesting is that they found that patients who had clinically N2 plus disease seemed to have some benefit, but again, this was a post hoc exploratory endpoint. So the standard of care for uh, operable oral stage three, stage four cancer is still surgery. Upfront. So, what is the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy? One, uh, one of the most uh, quoted articles for very adva locally advanced, undissectable oral cancers, and from Tata Memorial Hospital, which I part led the study. Uh, we gave two cycles of NECT to these patients, and we defined un a technically undissectable disease as tumor extension to the zygoma or soft tissue extension up to the hyoid. 43% had reduction and could undergo surgery. 
and patients who undergo surgery after ending CT had significant benefit in survival compared to those patients who didn't undergo surgery. Now, when we talk about uh, recurrent head and neck cancers, now this is not oral cancer, these are all recurrent head and neck cancers. I've just included these papers because these are very interesting papers and you won't get only oral cavity data for these. When you want to decide which patient should undergo treatment for recurrences, what they found that if you have a longer DFI, which was defined as more than 10 weeks, if you have a primary tumor depth of more than 10 millimeters, you should consider these factors before you actually consider treatment for these patients. Again, in recurrences, if the patient can undergo surgery, they tend to do much better in terms of outcomes uh, compared to patients who have undergone re-radiation or systematic therapy alone, both in five-year survival and overall survival and median survival. And these are the various factors prognostically which you should you keep in mind before you plan rec uh, treatment for recurrent head and neck cancers. When we talk about uh, recurrent head and neck cancers, we cannot but not talk about the seminal article by uh, Vermoffin et al., the extreme trial. Uh, again, this is all head neck where they looked at addition of cetuximab uh, with platinum-based chemotherapy as the first-line treatment for recurrent or metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of head and neck. This was a large study of 442 patients where they found a significant difference in overall survival. Of the 88 uh, oral cavity cancer patients who were involved in this, again, there was a significant difference in overall survival. So if you have a patient who is recurrent or metastatic disease, addition of cetuximab to platinum-based chemotherapy in chemo naive patients may actually improve survival in these patients. But again, it is not uh, well taken in our practice and that is because of cost issues. Now, there are a lot of uh, interesting newer studies, like I mentioned initially, the keynote studies have a lot of data coming in. Again, this is for all head neck, but uh, because they are not particularly towards oral cavity, I have not included them. One notable mention which I feel, which is not really impacted treatment, but is impacted uh, screening for oral cancer is the Shankar Narayan trial. It was an intervention study, uh, almost one lakh patients in the intervention arm and similar in the control group. They uh, found uh, 205 oral cancer patients on three rounds of screening. What was more important is that this oral cancer screening was more effective in patients who are high risk males that, with, that is tobacco and alcohol users and it actually reduced mortality in these high risk individuals and prevented at least 3, 000, uh, 37,000 oral cancer deaths worldwide. So cancer screening should be applied to patients, especially high risk male patients, tobacco and alcohol users. So I think that was a, uh, I may have missed a couple of articles which are landmark, but in interest of time, I think I've already exceeded my time. So I'll stop here right now. And I'm going to stop my screen share. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepa. Uh, that was a very lucid uh, sort of uh, presentation. It was you know, a very uh, cogent presentation and that was an exhaustive topic. You know, trying to comment on the landmark articles or the seminal articles in our field over the last uh, say several decades and more more so in the last uh, three decades where you know it's, i would say it's a moving uh, decades that we have had in the last uh, couple of decades so you've touched upon you know all aspects of uh, onco oral oncology uh, starting from you know uh, prevention with your effect of screening article which you last mentioned dr shankar narin's paper uh, with the disease biology, the epidemiology, epidemiology then with the, uh, the the importance of having the screening tool in, of an investigative, good investigative tool with regards to the imaging techniques that we have at our disposal. And then coming on to the management of neck. And uh, as we all know, there is uh, there's one, this landmark article that has come from our own country, that's uh, PMH Mumbai, which, which is something which has, I would say now it's no more a controversy now when it comes to management of N0 neck. Uh, and then you've touched upon managing uh, the different aspects of uh, surgical management of uh, uh, oral cancer with, with, with regards to the margin status, with regards to the locally or very locally very advanced uh, cancers, the, the T4Bs is what we say. And then also we've touched upon the important aspect of reconstruction 
and as you mentioned with both uh, uh, Dr. James Brown's uh, paper, right, with both with mandibular reconstruction and maxillary reconstruction, you know, they have with the availability of microvascular surgery uh, as as uh, as uh, armamentarium in our uh, reconstructive uh, thing. That has changed a lot of things. You know, we we don't shy away from you know going having taking wider margins when we know we have a reconstructive surgeon uh, or a team right. which will take care of you know uh, adequately reconstructing, which will take care of the other functional aspects uh, which are equally important when it comes to quality of life in our patients. Then lastly, you also touched upon the role of adjuvant treatment. It goes without saying that in advanced cancers, stage three, stage four cancers role of adjuvant treatment with, with radiation alone or with uh, chemo radiation, it's something which is uh, uh, imperative uh, when it comes to managing uh, cancer as a whole, as a multimodality management. Then role of uh, new adjuvant chemo, which you mentioned that uh, in resectable oral cancers, we have known through several studies in the last uh, decade and a half uh, that it has no role as such in improving oral survival. So again, the role of surgeons uh, is, uh, is something which is uh, uh, very important there. And, but certainly in certain unresectable cancers or in, uh, inoperable cancers, uh, there is a role from your own paper, Dr. Vijay's paper, which, which says that uh, it is something that we should consider. And it'll also sort of, you know, you can look at the, uh, assess the disease biology in those patients rather than jumping in and doing a, a, a sort of like a major uh, or a radical resection and then realizing within no time the patient has recurred it will give you that time to sort of decide whether if the patient doesn't respond much well with the chemo, uh, then you can actually uh, consider uh, maybe a, uh, just a, a non-surgical treatment options. And the, the recurrent head and cancers also that you've mentioned, which is something which, uh, you know, look, looking at the local or regional rec recurrences or having second primary cancers is something which we, com we all uh, encounter very uh, routinely in our practice. But the only downside with, I would say, we, we all being surgeons is that in head and neck uh, cancer, when it comes to head and neck cancers, uh, most of you, whatever important uh, studies that have been, uh, the, the level of evidence that is in there, it's all, we can say it's more of with the, the non-surgical management, not for surgical management other than the recent paper that has come in from the Cruiser. So there have not been that many papers and it's, it's very difficult to do randomized control trials in, 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 in the field of surgery. But I think uh, uh, the HNCOG and uh, institutions like TMH and some of the other institutions uh, are taking a lead in developing uh, some uh, sort of a feasible trials, which we can look at with a multi-institutional uh, sort of collaboration. I think uh, that's something we could look ahead uh, going forward because still the, the, the amount of uh, the burden that we have in a country with, when it comes to oral cancer, and uh, the, the overall outcome that we see oncologically uh, uh, that we see is something still not great. So we should probably look at and, and improving those in the coming years or decades. So thanks to you for a wonderful presentation. We'll see if uh, look to take some questions from the audience. Do you see her face? Yeah. I've shared so, some for you on your Yeah, way. yeah. So there is one uh, uh, doctor uh, by name uh, Sutan Raj uh, who wants to know that uh, any article which would emphasize on resection margins of, after NACT, after new adjuvant uh, therapy. So I, yeah, yeah, so I think the uh, literature is quite sparse. Unlike in breast cancer where uh, it's generally accepted that you can reduce margins, we don't have enough evidence in literature to say that after a new adjuvant chemotherapy for oral cancer, we can reduce margins. There was one study done by Anuja prospectively in around 60 uh, patients in our hospital where she did radial sectioning of margins after any city. And uh, the short of it is it was very difficult to really make out whether there, were, there was no, con there were different patterns of tumor shrinkage. And uh, it was not uniform across. So it's really still we don't have the answer whether we should uh, reduce our margins and it's better to go with the pre-surgical margins as far as possible. Saying that when you have given NACT for really disease which is going higher up and is, uh, with the aim to reduce the soft tissue, whether you can actually do it in practice that you go back to the original margin is problematic. But yes, we don't have evidence that uh, reducing our margins is safe. It seems to be okay looking at our data from TMH, Vijay Patil's data saying that even the patients who have undergone NACT may not have undergone surgery by the original margins, 
but they didn't have that much local references. But yes, we don't have prospect, large prospective data. And I hope this is one of the areas of collaboration, like uh, Girish mentioned, that we should look across different centers in our country. Yeah, right, rightly said, rightly said. So I think just to sort of summarize what you've said on this aspect, as we even when NACP is given, the tumor doesn't sort of you know, respond concentrically you know, all equally all around. So uh, always as, as a dictum, one should look to sort of go by the pre uh, chemo uh, as uh, extension of the tumor and then take your margins accordingly. Okay, next question again, uh, going, going with the, 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 the uh, comment on which we were looking at, looking uh, what, what could be the future trials that we can look for. Before that, she wants to know about any comment on uh, Joshna Naidu wants to know on uh, precision oncology in the era, era of evidence-based medicine. And also, what are the topics, in your opinion, requires more landmark trials or research in oral cancer? So, precision medicine is a difficult uh, topic to really mention about. It's not. Uh, it's a lot of targeted therapy, and you want want to look at markers. And I think this is where we need to look at perioperative interventions. So, just like the in the adjuvant setting, or rather in the recurrent metastatic setting, especially in lung cancer, where precision oncology has come up great way, uh, looking at targetable uh, agents like targetable mutations in these patients. So, if the patient has an EDF card mutation or an ALK mutation or whatever like that, if we can find out some mutations which are targetable and give them some perioperative interventions, like maybe drugs. Uh, perioperatively, either during surgery, before surgery, or immediately post-surgery, and see how that will improve uh, improve outcomes is something which we should look at. Uh, this is, I think, going to be the way for the future for us as surgeons to be relevant because with all the immunotherapy studies which are coming, we may have to eventually look at whether perioperative immunotherapy or any precision uh, targetable mutations are present in the biopsy specimens of patients with oral cancer and then maybe treat them with the drug and if they're responding, see if your extent of surgery changes or the outcomes vary. That's how I would look at it. Yeah, and the second part of her question is that any burning questions in our in our field which, uh, which can be incorporated uh, to find answers with future trials that we can come up with that she wants to know any topics that you want to touch upon so i think a lot of uh, especially for surgical patients uh, when should you actually upskill uh, radiotherapy and i think one of the uh, head neck i mean the uh, ncg is doing a uh, trial with tata being the lead the arrest trial where we are looking at even in early oral cancer ad adding adjuvant radiotherapy will it improve outcomes in patients who have uh, either a, depth, a larger depth of invasion between 6 to 10 millimeters or whether they have perineural invasion or poor differentiation. So that's an interesting topic. Again, uh, we've been, in Tata, we are looking at the role of metronomic chemotherapy, whether that will improve outcomes. And that, is, again, is something which is interesting, that a perioperative intervention, how it will improve outcomes. We have have to incorporate more molecular biology and translation research in our uh, studies. Most of us are doing retrospective data, uh, whether it is from the uh, Mazumda Shaw Center, whether it's from Amrita, whether it's from TMH. Most of our data from oral cavity, are unfortunately, is retrospective. We need to do well-designed prospective studies. Yeah, agree, agree. Couldn't have agreed more on that. Uh, and then there is uh, Kshitij Agrawal uh, who wants to know that any landmark, landmark study regarding reconstruction of tongue. I am not particularly aware of some study which I'll call landmark for reconstruction of the tongue. But uh, there are many small studies which suggest about which is a better flap. Again, these studies, none of these studies have really done a very large prospective head-to-head -head comparison between uh, uh, different types of flaps or different uh, modalities of reconstruction of the tongue to actually uh, see functional outcomes. So I'm not sure that there's any landmark study and maybe one or any of the participants or Girish can correct me on that. Yeah, I think uh, more so I think we can look at what are the commonly used uh, uh, flaps that we can look at when it comes to tongue reconstruction. So as we know, anything less than say 25% uh, of the tongue defect, we can still look at uh, you know, closing it primarily. 
although one should have a good idea as to how you close primarily where without restricting tongue mobility much is what should you should look at and secondly when you have to you know substitute adequate volume uh, to facilitate uh, uh, appropriate uh, swallowing then that's when you have to think of an of a flap uh, so uh, more commonly i think it's it would be the radial forearm or a lateral arm, or lateral arm flap for a moderate size defects and anything say or uh, extended hemiglossectomy or a uh, or near total glossectomy or total glossectomy uh, the commonly used one would be uh, uh, anterior lateral thigh free flap uh, again the the important aspect here would be to uh, when you to keep the the functional aspect of uh, you know reconstruction when you have to rehab these patients with speech and swallowing uh, it's important that you do a, a simple maneuver at the time of surgery is when you uh, sort of you know suspend the larynx to the mandible so that would uh, prevent the risk of aspiration uh, when patient tries to swallow in the uh, in the post operative period especially in, in, a, in a near total or a total glossectomy defect when you reconstruct that so anything else dr shalini has questions uh so i've sent you some on your whatsapp oh you sorry sorry to... sorry sorry no, no, i've not looked at it <laughs> yeah so so organ preservation trials there's uh, there's somebody who wants to know on that uh, again would not much hold hold for uh, oral cancer though but if you want to just mention uh, with uh, maybe with uh, larynx or hypopharynx you can just so for in oral cavity the only, uh, again like i mentioned the neo adjuvant chemotherapy trials by uh, zong and lisipra lisipra actually showed that there can be some amount of mandibular resections which can be avoided and uh, so that's sort of an organ preservation concept giving neo adjuvant chemotherapy to uh, prevent resection i mean reduce the resection mandibular resections and uh, we actually at tata memorial hospital have uh, proposed such a trial where we are going to give neo adjuvant chemotherapy no probable oral cancer dr devendra chaukar is leading it and uh, that is with the concept of organ preservation if we can preserve the mandible without affecting survival so that is for oral cavity but most organ preservation trials are uh, used in the context of larynx and hypopharynx and uh, the classical uh, seminal trials are the va the rtog the ortc the gotic trials it's really radically changed management of laryngeal and hypopharyngeal cancer where now most patients of stage 3 laryngeal and hypopharyngeal cancer will undergo chemo radiation up front rather than uh, surgery and uh, this is basically the organ preservation strategies which were due to these trials Uh, there's another question about any papers on consensus guidelines on margins in oral cavity cancer. Uh, yes, there are uh, guidelines on those. I'm sorry, I didn't mention them. But if some uh, the consensus groups which are there, which uh, Dr. De Cruz was a part of, have uh, statements on uh, these margins in oral cancer. We also have a recent uh, article by Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, which is a review article. which give uh, which has just been published hot of the press which look uh, gives a very good review on uh, margins in oral cancer so i urge you all to look up google and read it okay thank you thank you uh, any more questions dr shalini or uh, should we Uh, so actually i have yeah. a question oh yeah sure <laughs> sure uh, i i think uh, something that we are all uh, often confused about is address uh, addressing the contralateral neck nodes ma'am so uh, and literature is severely lacking in that as well so anything that you want to share on contralateral neck node uh, dissection for ipsilateral oral cancer tumors so we've got two data sets in our hospital one for tongue cancer these are both retrospective data sets the tongue cancer data set was led by sudhir and shiva and what they found is that if there's disease, uh, uh vikram and uh, sudhir this uh, if you had disease tongue cancers which were reaching the midline or crossing the midline and you had ipsilateral node positive then you should definitely address the opposite, opposite uh, neck because then there's a higher incidence of neck node metastasis similarly for buccal mucosa cancers or gingival buccal complex cancers if you have skin involvement and you have ipsilateral nodal positivity this was again studied by sudhir and manish 
and uh, then the incidence of contralateral lordal metastasis increases. So th th uh, these are the conditions. Again, the other standard indications for bilateral neck dissection would include tumors which are crossing the midline, base of tongue uh, involvement, tip of tongue involvement, uh, extensive nodes in the ipsilateral neck which are uh, with extra nodal extension, N3 nodes. In such case, you would definitely do the contralateral neck as well. Right. Uh, if you don't mind, ma'am, also uh, could you elaborate on the uh, chemotherapy trial that was uh, the, uh, I mean, that was uh, by Dr. Kumar Prabash, I think, uh, that was presented in ASCO. Uh, sorry, which one you're talking about? Metronomic chemotherapy. Hello. Lost you there. Last year, Shalini. Chemotherapy. Uh, that was presented at ASCO. Which ASCO? We've been having ASCO presentations every year now. <laughs> Dr. Prabhash's group is very think, prolific yeah, at the, trials. The, the, the same You're talking about the weekly and three weekly chemotherapy? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. 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 So the weekly three, uh, weekly chemotherapy was basically to see in the adjuvant uh, in the uh, patients who are receiving definitive and adjuvant uh, uh, chemo radiotherapy. What was the optimum dose of chemotherapy? So we had randomized patients into two arms uh, weekly, which received 30 milligram per meter square chemotherapy versus 100 milligram meter square three weekly. Uh, what we found that uh, it was uh, uh, the weekly results were significantly inferior to the no, uh, three weekly and three weekly chemotherapy should be standard of care. However, now recent trials which were published, uh, which were presented at ASCO this year, the Japanese group uh, uh, last year, as well as the trial this year showed that if you have 40 milligram uh, weekly chemotherapy, it may be equivalent to 100 milligram three weekly. So again, that's something which needs to be looked at. I hope I'm talking about the same study you are asking about. Absolutely, ma'am. I think you've given us more information than we asked for. Uh, there's some question on uh, management of ne neck in carcinoma in situ oral cavity. So I am not aware of any uh, particular publication which looks at neck nodal metastasis and in situ carcinomas, mainly for the fact that in situ carcinomas do not tend to metastasize. In situ is where the basement membrane has not been breached and that's why it's called an in situ. And so if the basement membrane is not breached, there's less likely there's going to be a neck node involvement in that. So I don't think I have read any, come across any paper where there are in situ ca cancers and their neck nodal metastasis. I think uh, some of it might might this this DAO question or this query might uh, come out from a biopsy which is done. Uh, many a times they would not take a, an adequate uh, sort of depth in the, or a thick, thick biopsy, so they would see a result or a report of it being uh, before surgery of it being a CA in situ, and then they are in a dilemma whether should we just do a, a wide excision and not okay. do not touch the neck. So that's when. So I think it's important to uh, to assess your lesion properly. And especially when you take the patient to operating room, go with the plan if the neck has to be addressed. So possibly you could do a thorough examination once the patient under, under is under general anesthesia. Take your uh, you know, uh, proper margins with your excision. Do a frozen section, and then again, if it's sort of you know sort of uh, it cannot be completely unequivocal on a frozen section, but if there is a reasonable lead for you to uh, understand that there is no much invasion, then possibly you one can observe. But if there is, then I think you 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 convert your surgery by dressing the neck, for which you should have counseled the patient beforehand. Right. Anything else, Dr. Shalini? So, uh, so then we'll conclude today's uh, session, sir. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Dr. Deepa, ma'am. I think uh, we've had a superb uh, session today. I think everybody who's tuned in would have had 
so much to take back from this. I'm sure all of us are going to go back to uh, Google and you know Google many of the articles that you've shared today. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Girish sir. I mean, you did a fantastic job. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you thanks, Dr. Uh, Deepa. Uh, it was Thank a very good so presentation. It was something today. to cover. Uh, and, uh, know, all, all about some such the, uh, articles in a presentation was a very difficult task. Sorry. I should thank my uh, resident, my fellow uh, Burhan. Burhan is amazing. He did the groundwork. I've just presented what he's put <laughs> together. So okay. I think he uh, de deserves all the acknowledgement. Okay. Good. Thank you, man. Thank you uh, to Burhan as well. I think uh, we've had an enlightening experience today. And thank you, Girish, sir, once again thanks, thanks, uh, thanks. for joining us. And to everybody in the audience, if you have any further questions or any, any further queries, you can always uh, comment on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel or even write to us at, uh, uh, at the email ID that we will share. Uh, so thank you so much for joining in. Please join us again this Saturday for a talk by Dr. Vikram Kekatpure on the rehabilitation of mandibular and mandibular defects. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks to the HCG team. Thank you, sir. Thanks. 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 Thank you, man. Bye. Bye. Take care.